Everybody, will you just stand with and worship with us?
Good morning, good morning. So good to see you guys here. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Pastor Sobey. I'm the associate here at Mosaic. I mean, we're so glad that you're here today. And if this is your first time, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. We're excited for what God has this morning. But man, I'm just so encouraged by this, this last song we just sang because I don't know about you, but there's times in my life where I forget I need to take God at his word. That man, what he says, he's gonna do. And you know, singing these songs, worshiping God reminds my heart of what is true. And so church, I encourage you as we enter into this time of worship, as we go into today of what God has for us, let's remind ourselves of his goodness, his faithfulness, what is actually true in the midst of our reality. So let me pray real quick. And we're just gonna invite God. God, we thank you that man, you are a God who can be taken seriously. What you say we can believe. What we know of you is true. You're faithful, everlasting, oh God. And so we worship you this morning. No matter our situation, whether it's good, bad, ugly, Lord God, we recognize you as God today. And we place our trust in you. Lord God, maybe we've never done that before, but today we're gonna put our trust in you. We're gonna try and take you at your word and see what happens. And so Holy Spirit, I invite you into this time. Do what only you can do. Work in a way that only you can. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
seconds. Amen. Amen. Can you just take the next 20 or 30 seconds and tell Jesus very specifically in your own words what you're thankful for? Can we just do that together? 
Come on, let's take a few seconds and just and just speak specific heart of gratitude for our Savior. Jesus, we thank you for our families. God, we thank you for our kids. God, we thank you for our parents. God, we thank you for life and breath. Jesus, we thank you for the roof over our head. God, we thank you for the times in life where you teach us and you guide us and you sharpen us. God, we thank you for all the blessings in our life. God, all the things that, that you've blessed us with. God, we thank you for the ability to bless others. God, we thank you, God, for this world that you've gifted us. God, that you've asked us to steward. God, we thank you for all the things that so much of the time we take for granted. God, the things that we just overlook. God, the moments that we miss when we could have brought you more honor and more glory. Jesus, we come to you with just a heart of gratitude today. And Jesus, if we never do another thing, if you never do another thing for us, God, we know that you're enough. We know that your spirit is enough, that your presence is enough. God, that everything that you've given us is enough. If you never did another thing for me, Jesus, what you've done on Calvary, what you did on the cross, how you rose from the dead, how you put your Holy Spirit inside of me, it's enough. And so today we just rest in contentment because we're yours, because you're walking with us, because your presence will never leave us. And we trust you today. We invite you to speak truth into our hearts, to open our eyes, to open our minds. God, the things in our life that are out of alignment with you, God, we lay at the foot of the cross right now, the place where you gave everything, the place where you laid down your life. Jesus, we lay down ours. And we do it all just out of a heart of thanksgiving because we know that without you, we're utterly lost completely without hope. We need you more than anything today, and we declare it as a church. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give our God a hand today? Amen. Amen. And I'm so glad that you're here today. Before you're seated, get to know somebody around you here at Mosaic Church. My name is Reagan, and I just want to welcome you here this morning. If you are a regular attender and we're used to seeing your face, or if it's one of your first times here, we are just so glad that you chose to join us this morning. Um, if it is your first time or one of your first times and you have not yet filled out a Connect card, we would just love if you would do that this morning. Um, they are in the seat backs in front of you, but um, they're just a way that we can connect with you and know that you are here and make sure that, hey, somebody follows up with you. Um, and we also have a gift for you at the Welcome Center. So you can drop those cards off either in the buckets on your way out or you can take it to the Welcome Center. And um, Bill and Jen would love to give you just a gift to say, hey, thanks. We are so glad that you joined us this morning. Um, I have just a couple of announcements for you this morning for things that are coming up. So next Sunday, April 14th, at 6 p.m., we have our Growing Leaders Gathering. And if you've been here over the last few weeks, we have been talking about it, and every week we say, hey, it says leader, and that means every single one of you. And we're not just saying that, we mean it. If you are a student, a teacher, a coworker, a parent, if you are just in a different space than I am, 
you have influence that I don't. And that makes you a leader in that space. And so we would really, really encourage you to come out and to grow with us in your leadership. It'll be a great night. So you can sign up for that on our website. That's next Sunday at 6 p.m. Um, we also have a class coming up called Alpha. Alpha is an awesome series if you want to grow in your faith and learn more about God and learn more just about our faith and kind of what we believe. Alpha is a great way to do that. Even if you have been a believer for a long time, I have done Alpha and have learned so much from it. So that is starting here at church on April 25th at 6.30 p.m. So we would love if you would get signed up for that and come to that if you have any questions at all about faith and would love to grow in your faith. Lastly, this morning, um, we have tons of events coming up. You can check out our app. You can check out our website. All of them are listed there. We have young adults event coming up, women's, men's things. So please, you can scan the QR code or go to our website and make sure that you stay updated on that. But lastly, um, we are gonna give you an opportunity this morning if you would like to participate in offering. Um, there are multiple ways to give. All of them are listed up here on the screen. But we are just so honored here at Mosaic by the way that you faithfully give. Um, everything that we do here, everything that you saw last Sunday, um, if you had friends or family that came for the first time, hey, we are able to to love them a little bit extra because of the ways that you give. And so we don't take that lightly. Um, but if you would like to participate in offering this morning, there are the ways that you can give and you can also give on your way out. There will be ushers and buckets on your way out. So I'm gonna pray over offering and the rest of service and we will get into it. God, we are just so grateful for this opportunity this morning to be just in your presence, God, to be together. Lord, there's nothing like coming together as a body of believers and worshiping you together. So Lord, I pray over the offering that we give this morning, Lord, that it wouldn't just be us giving, but Lord, we would be um, just giving back to you what you've given to us, Lord, and that you would bless that and multiply it and honor it as we're faithful in our giving. Lord, I pray over Pastor Joe as he comes and gives the word this morning, God, that we would have ready and receptive hearts to hear what you have for us today and this week. So Lord, we thank you for who you are and that we get to serve you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reagan. And good to see everybody back after an awesome Easter Sunday. Thank you if you volunteered in one of our, our two services last week. Uh, from the bottom of our heart, thanks. You made an awesome day happen. Uh, you paved the way for a bunch of people to hear the good news about Jesus Christ. And, and many, many people last Sunday accepted Christ into, the, into their lives and began a faith journey with him. And that's awesome news, isn't it? Can we just have got a hand for that? Jesus died on the cross and he rose again on the third day so that, so that we could share that news with everybody else. And so that was the goal last Sunday and, and that happened uh, to honor God and to share his message. And I'm just so thankful to be a part of church that, that really, really cares about reaching lost people. Um, you know, I, I was lost before I knew Jesus, right? And, and we have a world that is, is broken and that really, really needs Jesus more than anything. And so um, thanks so much for being here last week. But hey, uh, life goes on and we're here this week and I'm really, really, really excited to start a new series called Ask, Ask. And so today we're gonna be answering a huge question. But, but first of all, who's, who's gonna go see the eclipse tomorrow? Anybody? Anybody? Awesome. Um, I, I'm probably just gonna not fight the traffic and stick around here and, and, and I figure 99% is, is good enough for me, right? Um, but, but you know, with this eclipse coming tomorrow, I was trying to think of a great dad joke uh, to share with you this morning, but it just wasn't coming together. Some of you might get that on the way home. It's really bad. You know, hey, I've got, I got more today. No, I'm just, I'm just messing. That's all I got. Uh, but, but, but. Uh, you know, it, it's going to be a cool thing, and, and it's exciting, and, and what I love more than just the, <laughs> you can, come on now, and so, <laughs> um, and so what I love more than anything is I see families going, and they're going to spend time together tomorrow, just being together, and it, it's going to be a, it's going to be a great day of just family, 
And uh, my kids are off school. They're taking advantage of that, of that uh, excused absence day. It's like, is anybody going to be at school? I don't know. But uh, the kids are going to sure have fun. Uh, they could, many of them could probably care less if there's an eclipse, right? They're just like, excused absence? Yes, right? And, uh, but, man, I'm just excited for today. We're going to start this new series, Ask, and we're going to wrestle with some of the most commonly asked questions about God. And so today we're going we're gonna to deal with what's perhaps the most commonly asked question about God, maybe in the history of the world. And, and it's something that a lot of people really, it's an obstacle in their faith. They just can't get past it. They, they've never received a good answer for it. And so they just kind of stop at this point in their journey. And so we're going to ask the question today, why did God let it happen? And it could be whatever you know, comes to your mind, whatever big thing in life that you just, you just don't understand why God would allow that to happen. Or, or why doesn't God seem fair? Or, you know, some people put it like this. Why do bad things happen to good people? And I just want to give a disclaimer right off the, the, the front here in this series is that, you know, in each week when we answer these questions with Scripture, you will probably still have some more questions, and that's the nature of faith, trusting when we don't see. And so the notion that it's possible to answer every question about God does not really line up with the nature of God. He's bigger, he's greater. You know, we can't understand all the complexities of someone who was able to speak and the universe come into existence, right? But I would contend that we can find some pretty solid answers in God's word and that he's worth the search and the time when we need to step towards faith. And so I would also contend that the parts of God that have been revealed are more than enough, all right? And so that's what we're gonna look at today. I, I believe with all my heart that you can bring your questions to him, the biggest questions of life, and what he has revealed, and what he has shown you, and what he does have on the table for you can be more than enough for us to trust him and put total confidence in him. And so that's what this series is all about. It's about helping us understand some of the things that are harder for us to wrap our minds around and keep stepping, taking faith steps in trusting God. You know, we all come to a certain point in life where we have to deal with our lack. When we have to deal with the fact that we just don't understand it all, we don't get it all, our ability to comprehend everything about life there's constraints on that. I love the show Alone. It's where they, they send team, 10 people out into the wilderness and they have to survive and they get to take 10 items. And, and, and it, it's pretty cool to see the ingenuity of, and, and the ways that they figure out how to survive for a while. But here's the truth about all of them. They all have a breaking point. They all eventually come to the end of themselves physically, mentally, emotionally, they come to the end. They start off so confident. They have some wins, they build a, a fort, they get some food, you know, but eventually they hit a wall. Even the ones who win the show are usually starving and can't wait to be done. And it's only a matter, matter of time. You know, that somebody else is gonna get pulled from the show because of starvation and then they just win by default. It's not that they weren't declining. It's not that they weren't coming to the end of their cells. It was just a matter of when. And for some of you, especially when it comes to these big questions of life, that's how you feel spiritually. You're starving for answers. There's these nagging questions in your heart that you just can't wrap your head around. And you've come to the end of what you can understand for yourself and you're crying out to God and saying, God, help me. And if you're in that spot today, and, and maybe you have never even told anybody else, maybe this is private knowledge that, that only you know about you, but deep inside, you've got these doubts and these questions, and maybe you've just been having a fledgling faith, because, you know, it's like, it's like a Jenga thing. It's like, man, if you just take out one more piece, maybe the whole thing is gonna fall. Maybe that's how you feel spiritually. And so it's important to be able to ask these big questions and to hear 
good answers. And so today we're looking at this question, why did God let it happen? Why is this happening to me? Why do bad things happen to good people? You know, if you have kids or if you've ever been a kid, which is everybody here, right? I know for some people that's hard to believe that they've ever been a kid, but you've probably been involved in a discussion or two with your kids that included the words, that's not fair, right? I know I have. We have three amazing kids. I love them all. Nothing but proud of them. But they are experts at playing the that's not fair game. And as a good dad that really loves my kids, sometimes I say with all the love in my heart, I just, I really don't care if it's fair, <laughs> right? I, I, <laughs> you know, that's, that's not really important to me right now. And thankfully, God, God is, is, is a better dad than me. But many famous people in the Bible ask questions like this. In, in the Bible, Abraham asked the question, he said, should not the judge of the world judge fairly? Moses said, God, why don't you treat your people as they deserve? Jeremiah, the prophet, he said, why do the wicked prosper? It's not fair. The bad people are getting rich and the good people aren't. David in the Psalms, he, he, he looked to God and he said, God, why didn't you answer my prayer? God, where are you? Why don't you show yourself to me? Why don't you deliver me? God, why don't you seem fair? So really good people that really love God, that God used in powerful ways in Scripture, they ask the same question. Why didn't God seem fair? And we see God, on the other hand, say some pretty pointed things about fairness as well. For instance, in Isaiah 117, God says, learn to do good, seek justice, Correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Proverbs 31 9, it says, Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Psalm 82 3, it says, Give justice to the weak and the fatherless, maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. God had a lot of things about to say about acting in fairness, to seeing the oppression and, the, and the, the wrongs done in this world and making them right. In Psalm 34, 18, it says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. So God cares, God sees, God comes close. And then let's not forget John three sixteen. It says, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So why do I read all these scriptures and why, why do we see these two seemingly opposite sides? Because we see this tension. We see this tension that on one hand, God does see and God does care and God did step in and God did send his only son to pay the price for the sin of all humanity on the cross. It's like love like we've never seen it. Justice like we've never seen it. Amazing. And at the same time, we have these big questions. You know, today a lot of people ask it this way. They, they say, why do so many children starve to death? I've had this question before as I, as I look at the picture of the, the Compassion International child that, that my family supports. We've been supporting this, this kid, his name is Ajit, in Bangladesh for over 10 years, and I think, man, we're just supporting him, and there's so many others. What about all the rest? What about all the rest? And, and you know, we ask questions like, why do so many die in developing countries of preventable diseases? Anytime there's a natural disaster or a hurricane or a tsunami or a tornado or an earthquake or whatever, we're like, why do all these people die? Why do school shootings happen? What is the deal, right? Do you feel the tension? Or personally, you know, not just think, talking about things that are all over the world, what about when it gets down into your nitty, nitty gritty? God, why did this bad thing happen to me? Did I deserve it? Why is this going in the, on in the life of someone I love? 
Or God, if you can do something about it, why don't you? And all of a sudden, with all these questions and all these circumstances and all the junk that's happening, we're overwhelmed. We reach the end of ourself. And one of a few, a few things happen. Happens. We get apathetic. We get angry at everything, God, life, people, all of it. We get anxious because we can't control it. We get numb. And we just try to turn a blind eye so that we don't feel it anymore. Or we slip into doubt that we just can't get out of. Are we getting real yet today? This is where we're at. But as we attempt, which what I think is, is just really solid biblical um, basis today to answer these questions... I want you to remember that this life is not a game. It's all about real people with real problems and real lives hang in the balance. And so we have to consider these questions solemnly. There's no flippant answers. There's no one size fits all. There's no just one one little tweetable phrase that's gonna answer all these big questions, right? And we also have to remember that God never promised us all the answers, but that doesn't mean he's not good. And so with this as the backdrop today, let's look at some biblical reasons why bad things happen. So what do we know? The first thing that we know right off the bat when we look at scripture, and we don't have to turn far in the pages of the Bible, just right off the bat in Genesis, Genesis chapters one through three, we see that we live in a broken world. We live in a broken world. You probably didn't have to come to church this morning for to hear, to to understand that we live in a broken world, don't we? You know, our first reaction is to sometimes blame things that happen on the devil or to blame things on God, but the Bible is really clear that sin entered the world through man's choice. If you read Genesis 1 through 3, you'll see that God created the world and everything in it, and it was good. There was no sickness. There was no heartache. There were no cats. I was just seeing if you're awake today. You know, God only makes good things. He doesn't create evil or bad things. Maybe I added that one on about cats. That's just my personal preference. Um, but, okay, we'll, we'll scratch that one from the record. Cats, God created them, and they're good too. Okay, we're all awake now. But God, everything was good when, when God created the world, right? And when Adam and Eve sinned against God, the world was not as good as it was before. In that moment when man chose to sin, There were consequences. There was punishment. There was curses for the sin. You know, for instance, when when Adam and Eve had to leave the garden, one of the things that God said was that, ladies, now having babies is going to be painful, right? Anybody want to say amen to that? (laughs) Right. God said the ground was going to be cursed. That It's going to be hard to to get it to give you food and, and to make a living, there was going to be sickness. There was going to be death. You know, some, some pretty tough consequences to sin. And so it's, it's important to remember that from the very beginning when Adam and Eve sinned, that sin was the problem. That God didn't choose it. In fact, God was the one that warned Adam and Eve about what not to do in the garden. But what did they do? They did it anyway. They ate of the tree that God told them not to. Why? Because they believed the lie of the devil that if they ate of that tree, that they would be like God, knowing good from evil. They wanted to be able to determine for themselves what good and evil was. And so they did it anyway. And what happened? Their sin became our sin. And I know this is thousands of years in between, and it's, it's hard to comprehend, but this is what happened. 
And so when we look at the world today and, and why is it so broken and why do we live in a broken world, the answer is sin. And it's not just Adam and Eve's sin, it's my sin. You know, whenever I sin, I, I a lot of times have to bear the consequences of that sin that, that I committed. Other people's sin also affects me, it affects you. And, and when other people sin, it doesn't just hurt them. Many times it hurts others just as much or more than it hurts them. Which is why, you know, Jeremiah said, man, why do these people, they're sinning, but they're, they're doing well, but everybody else is being hurt. And then there's our sin. This is ways that as a society, we collectively have rejected God's ways. And then there's just straight up evil. And this is the, the devil's influence in the world. That, and, and it's true that we do have an enemy, the devil. The Bible is clear that he's prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And the devil was instrumental in the first sin committed. He's the one that tempted Eve to take that fruit and eat it in the first place. And he's still working to take you and I down today. And to make matters worse, we live in a world that by and large rejects the notion that sin is even a thing. Right? This is not a new thing, by the way. This is not a new thing. In Romans 1.21, uh, uh, Paul unpacks this to the Romans. He said, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, underline that, as a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. You see, this is what we do. We take what God has given us, and in our sinful minds, we twist it to look like something else. And it spirals out of control from there. This has been the temptation for every human being that has ever lived since Adam and Eve fell, to make our own rules, to decide what is right and wrong for ourselves, to live our truth, to be the masters of our own destiny. And we end up making decisions that do more harm than good. Romans 5.12 says it like this, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. So there's this progression of brokenness. But there was a turning point. In, math, in Romans 5, 18 through 19, it says, yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and a new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. And so we see that, very simply, the world is broken because of our sin. The world is broken because of our sin, humanity's sin. But Christ's one act of righteousness is the answer. And so God sees, God knows, God cares about the brokenness in the world, and he provided the answer to it. In fact, Jesus said in John 16, he said, in this world you will have trouble. So here Jesus is in the flesh, walking among men, teaching his disciples, doing his thing, and Jesus in, is in the midst physically of trouble and pain and hard times, experiencing things that people didn't like and people didn't understand. And then he said, but take heart, I have overcome the world, right? So Jesus himself, he's saying, listen, this is hard, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Man, there's, that's powerful, that this world is broken, that, that things are not as they should be, but Jesus stepped into it and came to be our savior. Why? Because we needed saving from all of this. All of the stuff that you see, all of the, the problems that you see, all the reasons why everything just seems so unfair is why Jesus stepped in. Can you imagine, and just think about the, 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 the irony of this, 
that we shake our fists at God. Why did you let this happen? And he says, I know. That's why I sent Jesus. That's why I promised to be with you. I sent him because it was so broken. God wants to say to you too, I see the brokenness too, and I've sent my one and only son to be the ultimate solution. You know, some of the things that happen in life are just absolutely horrible. Don't make any sense. Some of the abuse that we see and some of the atrocities that we see and the human trafficking and the, the lives that are, are robbed of their innocence so early and just some of the things that just make your stomach turn, right? Some of the things that you can't look away from without just, your, just, just bawling your eyes out and your heart breaking. Terrible. And so the thing that you need to get in your heart and in your mind when it comes to those horrible, evil things in this world is that when you look at scripture, you see that those things absolutely also break the heart of God. But the tactic of our enemy, the devil, is to confuse our reasoning and our thinking. You see, when bad things happen, our enemy wants us to see God as our enemy. The enemy of our souls, the devil, wants us to see God as the enemy, wants us to see God as the reason, wants us to blame him for the bad things that are happening. But in, the, in reality, but the reality is, is that when Jesus sees you broken in your life by sin, or sees all these other situations broken because of sin, whether it's consequential, whether it's completely undeserved treatment by someone else, whether it's a freak accident, whether it's a disease, you name it, whatever it is, it breaks his heart. It broke his heart so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to pay for all the sins of mankind on the cross so that people could turn to him and have new life both now and eternally. You see, the gospel message of Jesus Christ is that really good things happen to bad people. That's his message. That's his message. The message of the world is that the world is broken beyond repair and bad things happen to really good people. But Jesus came and he said, I want to do some really good things to people that don't deserve it, to people that are far from him. Whether you're hurt by sin that you committed or sin that someone else committed, Jesus wants to step in and help. Amen? Amen. And Jesus wants to do that for the whole world. God is so gracious. That is why as a church, as Christians, as Christ followers, we engage in and we support organizations and ministries who support the least of these. Organizations like Convoy of Hope that, that we talk about in, in November. Organizations like Project Rescue who, who minister to victims of human trafficking. Missionaries like the Turners that we support downtown Cincinnati who, who week after week after week serve the homeless population in our city. Missionaries all over the world. We've got missionaries in Peru and Madagascar and, and, and all over the place all over the place. Celebrate recovery right here on a Tuesday night, ministering to, to people who, who have life debilita debilitating issues of brokenness in their life. Why? Because we want to be a city on a hill in a dark, in a dark place. Because we live in a broken world. Matthew 5, 13 through 14 says, you are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its favor? flavor. Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Jesus stepped in as the light. And he called you and I to be the light in a very dark place. Amen? Amen. And so during the next two points, we're going to unpack two passages that bring this down to a very personal level. Because let's be honest. What do we do with all the pain and the heartache in the meantime? It's one thing to, to look from a really macro level that, okay, we live in a broken world. We live in this sin-filled world. But what, what in the world do we do with it in the meantime? 
What do we do with that? You know, we, we have Jesus and we're serving Jesus, but sometimes we still re- feel really helpless. And so what do we do? Number two, we have to remember as we journey through life that there's purpose in the pain. There's purpose in the pain. Scripture overwhelmingly addresses our in-between state as believers. What do I mean by in-between? And how can there be purpose in the pain when some things are just so evil? By in-between state, I mean that we are both in a place of pain and suffering, and we're able to be filled with the Spirit of God and walk in newness of life. Those two things are true at the very same time. That does not fit in our minds, in our our culture of comfort in America. It doesn't fit. So these two things can be absolutely true at the same time. That we live in a place of pain and suffering, and we're able to be filled with the Spirit of God and walk in newness of life at the same time. We view tough circumstances as inherently bad, and we over-spiritualize things, we oversimplify things, we want simple answers, we wanna say God caused it, or you caused it, or it's my fault, or it's your fault, or we just wanna be angry at the whole entire universe. But let me just encourage you today. There are times when we will never know exactly why something is happening, but God, is so faithful that he always will work himself through the circumstances for our good when we yield to him. This is what I I, I just want to call the Emmanuel factor. The Emmanuel factor. When Jesus came to the world, the angel said he's going to be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so Jesus stepped into our pain. He stepped into our brokenness, and he was with us. They wanted him to deliver them from Rome. They wanted him to bring all these physical changes to their life. And Jesus said, I'm going to bring a spiritual change to your life. I'm going to be with you in the midst of the pain and the suffering and all the junk of life. I'm going to give you the promise of my presence. And in that way, he interjected purpose into the pain. Romans 8, 18 through 25, and then we're gonna read verse 28. And during these next couple points, we're gonna read some long passages of scripture because they're just so good, and you need to hear it today. Listen to this. Yet, what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation, now now listen to how this speaks to this topic. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan. Stop right there. We groan when we see the brokenness and the pain in this world, don't we? We groan when we don't understand it all and when we don't have all the answers. We groan when we don't have the power to fix it. Listen to what it says. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. Is anybody there with me today? Does anybody else long for their bodies to be released from sin and suffering? Amen. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. And then jumping to verse 28. It says, and we know that God causes everything to work together 
for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. I love how the New, New International Version puts it. It says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Man, I hope that that passage of scripture just frames for you our predicament. That we live in the midst of pain and suffering, but we have a hope that gives us purpose, right? That even though we have the Holy Spirit, we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering, and there's this, there's this in-between state that we live in. So what does this mean? This does not mean that all things are good. You know when it says that we know that God causes everything to work for good, for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes for them? Does that mean that, that when something absolutely horrible and evil happens to you that that thing is good? No, that's not what it means at all. Th those things can be absolutely evil and horrible. So all things are not good, but it does mean that Jesus can work in all things for our good. Jesus himself predicted that bad things would happen to himself, right? Jesus stepped in and he said, I'm the light of the world. You know, if he needed to be the light, then the world must have been pretty dark. Jesus stepped in and said, I'm the resurrection and the life. If he needed to be the resurrection, then it must have been dead, right? And so what does this tell us? It tells us that in a world of darkness, in a world of hurt, in a world of death, and in a world of pain, that God is a redeeming God, and he steps into that, and he brings purpose to the pain. That he works in all things for the good of those who love him. And so when you decide to give your heart to Jesus, and when you figure out that Jesus is the way to salvation and he's the only way to heaven and you say, man, I God, I want to give you my life and I want to follow you because outside of you, I don't see any purpose in all of this pain and suffering. And so when you give your heart and life to Jesus, then all of a sudden God puts a purpose in your life that was not there before. And God puts you here right where you're at to make a difference. Why? Because only you can make a difference in your spot. Why? Because you're the only person that will ever, ever hold your spot. And there will never be another one of you. And so the question is, will we allow God to work through our pain and suffering? And your story is so important. Because, you know, you're the only one in it. And so you're the only one that maybe that God is going to use to minister in the way that He's gonna use you to minister. Because who better can, can minister to somebody who, who, is, uh, who is trying to recover from a life of addiction than somebody who came out of addiction like you? Who better to minister to somebody who's going through a divorce than somebody who's been through a divorce like you? Who better to, to, to minister to somebody who's seeking victory over drugs and alcohol than somebody who has experienced victory over drugs and alcohol like you have? Who better, who better to be used for God's purposes than somebody who has experienced the pain and the suffering that you have experienced? That doesn't make it good. It doesn't mean that God wanted you to experience that pain and suffering, but it does mean that he can step in and that he can redeem it and use it for his glory and for his honor. Come on, somebody. Amen? Amen. You see, this is a repeated story throughout Scripture that God is a God who redeems stories for his glory. Just like Joseph in Genesis 50, 20. Joseph said to his brothers who he could have been so mad at, he could have been so angry at them because they betrayed him. Joseph said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. And so although Joseph had been betrayed and oppressed and abandoned and put in prison and all this hurt had been done to him, God put him in a position of influence and power and transformation because God wanted to work a purpose through his pain. Amen? And so when bad things happen, the question isn't, did God cause these bad things to happen? The question is, God, what do you want to teach me? How do you want to use me? 
in the midst of this pain and this suffering and all these things that I can't control, God, how do you want to use me? The third thing that we see as we close today, I knew I had a lot of notes this week, but some weeks are just like that. Come on. The restaurant will still be open. I'll wrap up here quick. <clears throat> but the last thing that we see in Scripture that we're going to talk about today when it comes to this question is that this world is not our home. This world is not our home. Let me just say something really bold. It is not God's intention to work out everything perfectly in your life in this life. For some of you, that might be, sound kind of harsh. It's like, well, what in, what, what in the world? What are you talking about? Listen, if the pinnacle of our pursuit is comfort in this life, we may never find it. But if our pursuit is anchored in the life that is to come, we are absolutely guaranteed it. Where do we see this in Scripture? 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Satan, who is the god of this world. Whoa, let's, what, what do, let's just stop right there. What? Satan, who is the god of this world, which means that for a time, for a time, God is allowing Satan to tempt, influence, oppress, do what he's doing. Why? Because we all have free will. We all get to choose. We all get to choose. And this is something that has no explanation. It is what it is. But Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. Right? So there's this tension that, that man, there's a very real enemy that is fighting God, fighting you, and trying to take you down. And this is kind of the in-between state that we're in. And then Paul says, you see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts. Did I tell you that there's purpose in your pain? So we can know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is not from God, or that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. And then it goes on, we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live, in, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. Paul was not speaking figuratively here in these verses. He literally was under threat of constant death. He was being persecuted. He was being put in prison. He was being tortured. He was being beaten, all for the cause of Christ. But he continued to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ anyway. Let's continue. But we continue to preach because of the same kind of faith the psalmist had when he said, I believed in God, so I spoke. We know that God who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit. And as, and as God's grace reaches more and more people, that's our purpose, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. This is why we never give up. 
Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and they won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles that we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. What is Paul trying to tell us? That we're broken, that we're fragile, that we can't understand everything that happens in life. We're carrying scars, we're carrying wounds. We're, you know, we have this treasure in jars of clay. But God has put this incredible message in your heart and in your life. God has sent his one one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die in your place on the cross, to set you free, to give you a purpose in this life, and not just for this life, but for the life to come. And so he says, don't fix your eyes on all the things here and now. Fix your eyes on the things that cannot be seen. You know, I like to say it like this, that I'm just one broke beggar trying to show another beggar where to find food, right? Man, that's a really good picture. I don't have all the answers. I don't understand everything that happens. I don't understand all the pain and all the suffering and everything that happens, but I do understand this, that Jesus died for me and he put a message inside of me and it's a saving message that is the hope of the world. And that God is working himself into the pain and the suffering and all the things that are happening in this life, all to bring glory to his name. And so I've got this hope, I've got this message, and Jesus is preparing a place for me. Jesus came to be a light in dark places. Jesus didn't come for healthy people. He came for the sick. He came to be the answer. And so when I find myself asking the question, God, why do bad things happen to good people? Or why did you let this happen, God? I remember that, man, I live in a broken world with a very real enemy. But Jesus came so that there could be purpose in our pain. And we have hope. Not be, We have hope because this world is not our home. And we believe in Jesus. Amen? And so, man, if you're struggling with this question today, I just, I just want to speak right into your heart and right into your spirit today. God sees, God knows, and God cares about those things that are heavy on your heart. And he sent Jesus. And he's sending us to be light in dark places, to light up the world with the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. But having Jesus in your life is absolutely essential if you're going to have hope in a broken world. Because without Jesus, it all does seem lost. Without Jesus, it all does seem just unfair and it seems like there's no purpose and there's no reason to live. But with Jesus, He puts that treasure in a broken jar of clay, just like you and me. And he says, go, share the light, share the message, share it with a world that is desperately in need of answers and of hope. Amen. Amen. No Jesus, no hope. But with him, we see purpose, in this in-between stage that we're in and where we're able to, to walk forward even when we're pressed, even when we're crushed, even when we're abandoned, even when we've experienced evil things. God is gonna use us for his glory and his honor. Amen? Amen. Bow your heads and close your eyes with me today. If you're here today and you say, Joe, <clears throat> I've been crushed. I've sinned. And I'm experiencing the consequences of my sin. I realize that I need Jesus, that I, I, I am not in relationship with him. And I want to step into a relationship with Jesus Christ today. I want to step towards him as my savior, as my reason for living, as my reason for being. I want him to be the leader and director of my life because when this world was broken and dying, he came to be the answer. And I want him to be the answer for my life too. If that's you today and you want to say, 
that you want Jesus to be the Lord of your life, I want to encourage you to just raise your hand all across this place. You say, I want Jesus. I need Jesus. I want Jesus to be my Lord. I want to accept him today as the answer to my life. Amen. Amen. If you raised your hand today, I want to encourage you to pray a prayer. Inviting Jesus into your life. You could say, Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and the sins of all humanity. And I believe that you rose again on the third day. And so I trust you now with my life. And I accept you as the Lord of my life. Help me to follow you the rest of the days of my life and bring you honor and glory with my choices. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you pray a prayer just like that and you mean it in your heart, man, we believe that Jesus takes residence in your soul and in your life, and now he's going to lead you and guide you in a new way, as a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Amen? Amen. It's an amazing thing. Go ahead and stand with me today. Like I said at the beginning of this message, you know, even when we unpack some of these questions, you're still going to have doubts, and you might still have questions, and, and um, there's nothing special about me, that's for sure. And so I might not have completely, adequately answered all your questions. And so I want to make that a matter of prayer today. Because God is just really cool that even when man can't answer all our questions, guess what? His Holy Spirit can do a work in our hearts that we can never do on our own. And so I just want to pray for you today that as, as you continue to search and ask, and that's the whole point of this series is to ask questions. And so I want to encourage you to keep seeking because the Bible says when you seek with all of your heart, you'll find him. And so let's keep seeking him today and let's just pray a prayer, asking God to give us purpose in our pain and to remember that this world is not our home. God, we need you. And so I just pray that as we continue to ask questions, and some of the questions, God, we might feel that uh, we, still, we still have questions and we don't really feel like we know all the answers. And God, I pray that in those times and with those things that we're able to just let your Holy Spirit give us peace. God, that you just settle our hearts and our minds in your word. That you let, that you let your word just be a firm foundation under our feet that we could stand on. God, I pray that the anxious thoughts, you just take them away in Jesus' name. God, the, the numbness that we might feel because of all the pain and suffering, God, I pray that you replace that with joy that comes from your Holy Spirit. We invite you to do in our hearts and our lives what only you can do because we know that you really are the answer to all things. And we thank you today for stepping into the mess, for stepping into the pain and the brokenness and being our answer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. There's going to be a prayer team up front. If you need prayer for anything today, I encourage you to take advantage of that. But um, you're dismissed. Have an awesome week. Thanks for being at Mosaic.